it's great to be here in Bologna at Pragma Conference. And today I'm going to talk to you about full stack development with Swift. And hopefully by the end of this talk, some of you, or maybe even the whole room, will be going back to your companies going, we want to server side Swift all the things. Maybe. Anyway. So we've done the introduction, so we can skip through most of this. Uh, the important part is there. If you have any questions, just ping me on Twitter or Slack or GitHub or Discord. I'm 0xTim, and that 0x is in writing hex, and not ox is in the letter. It really confuses people. Um, and as Daniel said, I organize, I'm one of the co-organizers of the serverside.swift conference, and also run a number of other meetups around the world. So before we get going, let's have a bit of audience participation. So a quick show of hands. Who, Put your hand up if you consider yourself to be a full stack developer, or you write any kind of API code for your apps. And of those of you who've got your hands up, keep your hands up if you work for a large company of, say, more than 100 people. And that's quite a lot less. And that's, that's kind of the way things are. If you're a big company, you tend to have separate back-end and front-end teams. But this is problematic. So why would you do full stack development? Well. The world has moved on. Back in the early days of software development, we had Waterfall, and it was great, apparently. And you could do separate teams, because you had your back-end and front-end teams, and then up before any work started, you had your API agreed. And then you'd go off for several months, and at the end of it, you'd come together, and it would just work, apparently. But these days, things don't work like that. We need to adapt. We need to change. We need to keep up with our customers' demands. And if you have separate front-end and back-end teams, you can't be agile. It's just not possible. How many of you have tried to do this? You want a new API, you want a new feature in your back end, and you've been told, oh, submit a Jira ticket, we'll get around to it when we can in several months' time. So if you're trying to do that, you can't keep up with what you need. And alongside this kind of full stack development that we're seeing, movement in the, in the industry, there's also this kind of move to apps. And we're kind of seeing a move away from websites to apps, especially in the enterprise. And this conference is a very safe conference to go, go down this route, because it's an iOS conference. Um, but people are moving away from, from websites, and especially on mobile phones. And there are a number of reasons for this. Progressive web apps just aren't living up to the hype. The functionality isn't there that you get with native apps. And I am aware there was a lunchtime app about React Native, and I'm trying not to, to kind of tread on it too much. But React Native and other cross-platform technologies, they just have too many disadvantages. We're seeing companies like Dropbox and Airbnb moving away from cross-platform technologies because they don't really work very well for big, complex apps. And you get poor user experience with them. They're slow. They, they, they don't fit with the OS. And especially in the UK, and not, most of the large bank, banking apps are cross-platform. And it's so easy to tell, because you start them up. They don't look anything else like the, old, uh, the other OS apps. You have the big bars at the top, because they still haven't been updated for the notch. Um, and they take 10 seconds to start up. I tried a, another banking app um, recently, and you start it up, and the first half of the top half of the home screen is a cookie acceptance notice because they're just loading a web view. And you try and dismiss it, and then it comes back next time you launch the app. So I stopped using it. And that's before we even get onto things like dark mode or any of the new APIs announced this year, or even accessibility. And what about old devices? Because sure, your your cross-platform solution may work really well on the latest iPhone 11 Pro that you have, but what about some of your users who are still using an iPhone 5 or some of the old Android devices? We need to consider these things. And so all roads lead to Swift, obviously. So why Swift? Well, as we all know, Swift is a hugely popular language. We all love it. It's growing quickly. It's easy to get going, but it also has the complexity and the power if we need it. It's built by Apple, which means there's a big momentum behind it. And we can be fairly sure that it's not going to be dropped in the next few months, unlike other large technical tech companies. And it's also been open sourced. And it's very unique as a language in that we as a community can steer the direction of the language. We can submit evolution proposals or bug fixes onto GitHub and have our changes incorporated into the language. And that's really <coughs> unique for a software language. It's also really modern. A lot of these legacy languages, or languages that we've used and grown up with, like Java or JavaScript or Python, or even Objective-C, they've been around for decades. And the software world's changed. And Swift has been able to learn from the mistakes of those languages and take the good parts and just throw away all the bad parts, because they don't need to kind of accommodate 20 years of tech debt. So it's a really nice language. 
it's also really safe. Swift is strongly typed, it's statically typed, which means whole swathes of errors just are not possible in Swift. If you write good code, your app should never crash. Things like null pointer exceptions, we don't have them anymore because of optionals. And it's also fast. Swift has the potential to be close to C performance. Because we're not wrote, uh, running up a um, interpreter, we don't have a runtime that we need to run, and we compile our languages, which makes it really performant. And the biggest reason why we should all use Swift is because it's not JavaScript. <laughs> and I'm not going to stand here and bash JavaScript for half an hour. However, companies who use this on the back end for criti mission critical apps and applications, I just don't understand because it has so many risks. So you're going to use Swift on your mobile devices on iOS, but now what about the back end? Well, ever since Swift was open source, there's been a new wave of kind of web frameworks that written in Swift. One of them is Vapor. So Vapor was created in February 2016, just a couple of months after Swift was open sourced, by a guy called Tanner Nelson, and then Logan Wright came along uh, almost immediately afterwards and built it up. And that is built on top of Swift Neo. So Swift Neo is Apple's non-blocking, event-driven I.O. framework. And it's basically the really low-level library that powers a lot of today's Swift web frameworks. So it does all the things like socket communications and HTTP parsing, which means that Vapor can concentrate on providing a really nice framework and a really nice API with lots of features when Swift Neo can do all the gnarly bits like threading and stuff like that. Vapor has kind of chosen to make use of the latest features of Swift. So some of the other web frameworks, like IBM Scatura, IBM Scatura is an enterprise framework. It's for enterprises to use. And enterprises don't like change, which means that they can't adapt quickly. They can't pick up things and make things like function builders or property wrappers or uh, key paths central to the framework because they're sp still supporting enterprises who have got two-year-old code bases. And can you imagine if we had to support now Swift 2 code? We need to be able to evolve as our code, especially while Swift and Swift on the server is so young. And, Swift is all, and Vapor was also written by Swift developers for Swift developers. So it has a really nice API that's easy to get going, and we understand it. And we'll see some of that later. It's the most popular Swift framework out there. And the reason behind this is the community. Vapor has an absolutely awesome community behind it. It's the most passionate, engaged, welcoming community I've ever been involved with in any kind of software environment. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of developers there who are there to answer questions, help you with your code. We moved from Slack to Discord because you'd post a question on a Friday, go away for the weekend, and come back, and more than 10,000 messages have been going over the chat over the weekend, and you've lost your answer. So it's really, really incredible community. So if you're a developer and you're going, right, I need a back end, why would you choose Vapor? Well, to start with, you get, you're happier. You're a happier developer. You get to use language you know, you understand, and you love. You don't have to go and learn a new language. And there are great other languages out there for back end apps. But you, you, you have to go and learn them, whereas we can, you can just use the language that you know. You get a compiler. And this will blow some people's minds, especially coming from JavaScript in the web world. You can actually see if your code is going to break before you ship it to production. And for all of Xcode's flaws, it's still a great IDE. And we've learned how to use it. We've learned how to use instruments and profile our apps. And you can use all of that same tooling when writing your server-side apps. You get debugging support in Xcode. So if you need to put a breakpoint into a request to work out, why is my logic not working? You can do it exactly the same as you do it with iOS apps. But if you're a business, why would you let your developers use server-side Swift? Well, like everything else in life, it comes down to money. So Vapor is a completely non-blocking asynchronous framework, including the database drivers, which is very, very rare for any fr web framework of any language. And this gives it the potential to be really, really performant. It means you can handle more requests per second. And because you can handle more requests per second, you need less servers, which means it costs less. But the big benefit of using Swift on the server is the memory footprint. A typical Vapor application will come in around six megabytes. If you compare that to something like Java or JavaScript or PHP, we all know how much RAM it takes to just run Slack on our laptops. You're talking orders of magnitude difference. And we've seen companies move away, move from um, PHP and things like that 
to Swift and see huge performance gains. There's an agency in Europe who a couple of years ago went all in and said, we're going to use Vapor, we're going to stop using PHP. And they moved from self-hosting on AWS to using Vapor Cloud, which is kind of platform as a service, so there's an incurred cost there. And they saw their server costs drop by 80%. That's 8-0. And that's a significant cost you can take back to your company and go, maybe we should consider this. And because you need less memory, you need less servers. And this is especially true if you're using microservices. If you have lots and lots of microservices, if each microservice needs half a gig of RAM, you're going to need a lot of RAM. If you're talking tens of megabytes, you can fit a lot more on a server. And it's also safer because we don't have all of these errors that you have in some of the other languages. Because you have type safety, you know that your user model is a user and it has these properties rather than having to guess or check. You're not going to be woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning because your server's gone down. So how do we deploy these apps? Because it's great we can write it on Xcode and use Mac OS, but no one really deploys on Mac OS. And that's fine because ever since Swift was open sourced, you can run it on Linux. And because you can run it on Linux, you can run it in Docker, which basically means you can run it anywhere. So if you want to run your code on AWS or Google Cloud or Azure or even Heroku and Vapor Cloud and stuff like that, you can. It's really easy to deploy. And some of the tools provide single commands to just push your app up from your computer up to the cloud and to the internet for you to use. But the biggest question I always get asked whenever doing any of these talks or workshops or talking to companies is, well, it sounds great and all, it sounds really fun, but is it ready for production? Obviously, the answer is yes, because I wouldn't be here, but it is ready for production. And we, over the last kind of six months to a year, we've really seen a big shift in server-side Swift with the release of things like Swift 5 and Swift Neo 2, which are providing a real stable foundation for the future. There's the Swift Server Working Group, which is made up of Apple and Vapor and Kotura, who are all there to basically build an ecosystem. And they're concentrating on packages like logging, metrics, and monitoring. Open API so you can describe your APIs, database drivers that are performant and battle tested, and authentication because you don't want to reinvent the wheel when you're doing security. And by using these packages and providing these packages, people be, can be sh safe and sure that these packages have been tested and they'll be supported and they'll work. And a great example of Swift on the server's kind of maturity was an issue um, from earlier on in the year. There was a memory leak in a Vapor app. And people from Apple and people from IBM and people from Vapor and the wider community all got together to just debug this issue and work out what was actually a really gnarly low-level bug in MySQL. So as Daniel mentioned, I organized a conference about server-side Swift. And last year, we had loads and loads of really good talks about companies actually using it in production. And it was amazing to see the number of companies who were using it in production. So for instance, Mercedes-Benz, a lot of their in-car entertainment systems are powered by Keturah. A lot of their dealership software is powered by Keturah. ING, the bank, and one of their subsidiaries, the Internet of Things, they're actually processing payments and moving money around with Swift on the server. So it's actual money changing hands here, and they're sure enough that Swift will work. Nodes is a big agency in Copenhagen and London and Germany. And they, all their backends for all their clients, and they have big, big clients, are written in Vapor. Allegro, who are Poland's Amazon, basically, they're a huge e-commerce site. And they did a really interesting talk last year about how they've moved some of their microservices over from Java to Swift and seen incredible performance benefits. Amazon. Amazon have got their own Swift web framework called Smoke. And they're using it in AWS. And they're going to be talking about it at the conference late, uh, at the end of the month. And so these big, big companies, you've got the BBC, mainly because I used to work for them. But they use Swift on the server for in their internal tooling and CI and test infrastructure. And IBM, if a company as big and slow to move as IBM are using Swift on the server, you can be fairly sure it's actually pretty good. And obviously, the big elephant in the room, or the apple in the room, is Apple. They're pumping a ton of money, of engineering time, of effort, into making Swift on the server a viable product. They'll never come out in and explicitly say it, but they have said they're using it in production, but never, they'll never explicitly say what. But a large proportion of their iCloud and server infrastructure is using Swift. So I could stand here and talk all day about Swift on the server, but I'm actually going to show you some demos because that's way more fun, and there's also a chance of it going wrong, which is way more exciting. <coughs> OK. so.
I have an app here. It's a very pretty simple app. Unfortunately, it's not Swift UI. I'm really sorry. Um, but it's a, a simple table view that has some reminders and users. And you can load up your reminders, look at your reminders, and you can click through to users, and users got statuses and stuff like that. But in this app, can you actually see that at the back? Yeah, good? OK, cool. Um, in this app, I have two models. So I have a model for my user and a model for my, my reminder. And these are the models I use to when I request them from the back end. But it's also the same model I'm using on the back end. And because it's the same language, well, why can't I just share it? So what we're going to do is we're actually going to create a new Swift package. And I'm going to call this Reminders Core. And for now, I'll add it to my iOS app. And this will create a brand new Swift package, thanks to Xcode 11's uh, Swift package support. I used to do this in CocoaPods, but it's now Swift package, which is fantastic. And you get a whole package by just creating. You have a readme, you have a manifest file, and you have your sources. And I can just drag my models into this library, and they're there, and I can use them. And this is a package I can now share. So if I go to my iOS app, I'm going to add the core library as a, as a um, framework. And then if I build it, I'll get some build errors, uh, because I just need to import my new library. Cool, and that now build. So I'm using my models from a separate package um, that I can now share. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to close this because Xcode actually doesn't like having two projects open using the same package, but we'll pretend that doesn't exist. So I'm going to open my manifest file for my server. Now I've done a bit of pre-work here already to get it going, um, but if I open up my package.swift, I can then add in my local dependency for, for now, but in the real world, in a real app, you probably want to pull this down from GitHub as a release. Um, and then I'll make it dependent. So if I now save that, that should now pull it down and pull the uh, package down. And you can see down at the bottom there, it's pulled it in. So if I go into my uh, model directory, I've got a file here that I'm going to write some extensions so I can make my models work with Vapor. So I have a user. So the first thing I'm going to do is my, make my user conform to content. Now, content is just Vapor's wrapper around Codable. And it allows you to send and receive it as JSON or form data or anything like that. I'm then going to make it conform to parameter. And this allows me to send and receive the ID as a parameter, and Vapor just pull it out really easily in the URL. I'm going to make it conform to SQLite UID model, um, because it has an UID as an ID. And this allows me to just query it in a database. And you'll notice I'm not writing like what the table name is or what the column names are because Vapor can automatically infer that for me. And finally, I'm going to make it conform to migration. And this just basically tells Vapor to create the table when it first starts up. And I'm going to do the same for my reminders. Make it conform to content. Make it conform to parameter. Make it conform to SQLite model. It's a model this time because it has a different, it has an ID as an integer. And I'm going to make it conform to migration. Now, my reminder model has a um, link to the user ID. No idea, I want to print. So you can see here I've got a, u a user ID. And I'd like to actually link this in the database to kind of provide some safety. And even though my model is actually defined in a shared package, I can still do that. So I'm going to override the prepare function, which is run when the database is started up, when the database is prepared. And I'm going to um, implement the create function. And I'm going to create the reminder table on the connection. And then I need to kind of add all the different uh, properties. So in user, we did this automatically, but for now, I, for this one, I actually have to do it manually. But there's a really handy helper in Vapor to do that for me. So this will add all the different columns in the database. And then I'm going to add a reference. Is there? There is. Ah, that's why. 
Thank you very much, well spotted. So I'm going to add a reference um, between the two tables. So I'm going to add a reference from my user ID, and that's going to be linked to the ID of the user table. Now that means if I try and create a reminder with the user ID that doesn't exist, I'll get an error in the database. And this is all coming from a separate package. And the final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my reminders controller, and this is where I define all my routes for that reminder. I'm going to create a couple of routes just to show you how easy it is to create routes in Vapor. So I'm going to create a router route to create a reminder. Um, and this is just going to return a future reminder. Um, and that just means it's basically going to return the reminder once it's saved in the database. So I can basically decode the request content, which is the body of the request, as a uh, reminder, and then just save that in the database. And I'm not doing any SQL, I'm not kind of defining where it needs to be saved, it's just all automatically done for me. I'm then going to do a function to get all of the reminders in the database. And this is going to return a future array of reminders. Generics, so on. there we go. Uh, and to do this, I need to perform a query, and then I need to kind of decode all the data from the database into my model. And it's quite difficult. You basically just do reminder.query.all. And it paper does it all for you. And finally, I'm going to get a single one from the database. And this is going to return, obviously, a single reminder in the future once it's retrieved it from the database. And I want to basically pass an ID in the URL and it to extract it for me and return that in the uh, from the database. So I can return the request parameters and get the reminder out. That's all. So let's just add these routes in. So if I send a get request to my reminders thing, I want to get all the reminders. If I send a post request, I want to create a reminder. And then if I send a get request to the reminders routes slash the ID, which is the reminder.parameter, I can then use the get handler. And that should all build. Cool. So I'm going to run this from the command line because uh, there's a bug in Xcode. Uh, where it doesn't like the package being opened, as I said. Um, and if I go to my iOS app, I can build and run my iOS app. There we go. And you can see I have my uh, reminders and I have my users. And that's all using the same model, uh, sharing between the two. Now, the final thing I want to show you is editing, I think, my uh, models. So let's open up my server package again. And I'm going to open up my user model. Now, this is my shared user model that I'm editing here. And let's say, for instance, I wanted to provide a date when the user was last updated. So when I uh, edit my user, which I'll do in the user controller, I can basically set the last updated date to the current date. And then I can run that. And then in my iOS app, I want to display that in the user table. So if I open up the user table view controller, uh, so I have my detailed thing here that shows the status. But let's say if let user dot last update date uh, I'm going to show user status uh, and then with a, like an updated and the time so it's just gonna be updated uh, last updated and then I've got an extension down at the bottom to make the string look a bit nicer otherwise I'll just do what I did before and just set the status and so if I build and run that I can go to my users and I can click my name and I'm not preparing a talk anymore. I'm giving a talk. 
uh, and I update my user, I go back, and you can see it's updated the date. Now, that doesn't look particularly interesting or particularly fun, and we've all kind of written simple apps like this, but if you take a step back and think about it, I've just added a date to my shared model. I haven't defined how that date's going to look on the server side. I haven't defined how that date's going to look on my iOS project. And I chose date for a reason there, because dates are really complicated. Things like strings and ints, we all have um, um, booleans. They have native types in JSON, which is what, kind of what we use to share the API. But dates, there aren't really any. And if you're interacting with a JavaScript API or a Java API, you always have to go, oh, okay, what, what format's this going to send me in? And write your custom date formatters. But this is Swift on both ends, so I don't care how it happen, goes across the wire in the middle. But because I know it's Swift on one end and Swift on the other end, I know it's going to be the same. Okay, so where to go from here? So some shameless plugs. Um, there's a video course if you want to learn more. At, and as Daniel mentioned, there's the book I wrote with the Vapor Core team. I think there's actually one to give away in the raffle tomorrow, uh, so make sure you enter that. Um, but some next steps for you. I'm not saying go away, throw away all of your backend code and rewrite it in Swift. As great as that would be, it's, if it works, there's no point changing it. But what I am saying is, Maybe take a step back. Next time you need an API, or next time you, you need a backend or a new feature, think about writing it yourself. Take control of your server applications if you're writing iOS apps, especially if that app's only used, if that backend's only used for your app. So if it's a shared app with the web and the Android app and an iOS app, fair enough, that's probably going to a different team. But if it's like a config app for your iOS app only, why not write it in a language that you know and you can control, rather than giving it off to another team that you have no control over? and try and encourage a full-stack microservices approach. So split up your backends and your iOS apps into small segments that you have control over the full stack of, and it's going to allow you to move more quickly and adapt to your customers' needs. Thank you very much.